and welcome to episode two of Take Me Back Tuesday. My name is Kristen Evans and I'm the Executive Managing Director at the Gershman Philadelphia Jewish Film Festival. And I also happen to be your lovely host every other Tuesday. I will be chatting about a throwback Jewish, heavy on the ish film. And as I had mentioned in the first episode, some of the films will be overtly Jewish while others give a nod to Jewish life that are tucked between, tucked between the lines. Uh, the film selected for this Tuesday did not win any notable awards. However, it was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Comedy or Musical. Uh, don't know why. Don't know why they clump those two together. They seem very different, but comedy or musical. And it was nominated for an MTV Movie and TV Award for Best Comedic Performance and Best Fight Scene. Uh, many of us who have seen this film will simply remember it as a quirky, little stoner, action-packed adventure film. Uh, this Tuesday, I will be talking a little bit about Dale Denton and Saul Silver's epic weed-infused adventure in... K-R-A-D. You know, I think that last caller had some undeniable points, but right now we're going to get to the next caller, Dale Denton. Hey, Sam. Big, huge fan. First-time caller. Here's my piece. All right. If marijuana is not legal within the next five years, I have no faith left in humanity, period. Everyone likes smoking weed. They have for thousands of years. They're not going to stop anytime soon. You know, it makes everything better. It makes food taste better. It makes music better. It makes sex feel better, for God's sake. It makes shitty movies better, you know? It's a fun movie. But my personal belief is that Hollywood has a long-running love affair with stoner buddy comedies that border into the whole bromance thing from Cheech and Chong's Ganja Puffing in the 70s and the 80s to Harold and Kumar's marijuana-fueled misadventures. Pothead comedies have established a blazing niche in American cinema and mainstream culture, aside from any sort of debate of its use in religious Jewish rituals. It honestly was probably only a matter of time before this generation's rated R comedy king, producer, director, Judd Apatow. I think I, I don't know. I think I might be saying his name wrong, but that's probably how I'm going to say it a million different ways um, in this video. But he turned his attention to a talking genre. So Apatow produced the Pineapple Express while Seth Rogen, who's a main character in the film, and his childhood friend, Evan Goldberg, they actually met during bar mitzvah class together, um, they wrote the screenplay. Um, in fact, they actually, all three of them have a long history of working together. Apatow actually discovered Rogen and put him in a fun series called Freaks and Geeks. Um, side note, I really love Freaks and Geeks, and so I would encourage you during this time to also check out that series. Unfortunately, I guess because they didn't have enough viewers, it really only lasted one season. Very sad. Tears. Tears of sadness. Uh, one season. In hindsight, it was an all-star cast, uh, and it, it's a great show. It's a great show. So take your time, binge it, savor it, um, and I hope you enjoy that film. But back to Pineapple Express. I hate assuming that even though I think I'm picking films that most people have seen, it really is not safe for me to assume that you've seen this film so I wanted to give you a lickety split pot, plot, plot summary. We did a lot of like looking up of pot and origins and 420 and whatever. I think it's on my brain. So I apologize. Apologize. Plot summary of the Pineapple Express. Or if you happen to have seen it and you had been smoked up and munched out, 
and have like a hazy recollection of this film, this is for you. So this film was released in 2008 and it stars Seth Rogen who plays Dale Denton. Uh, he is a 25 year old process server uh, who spends much of his day delivering legal summons to unfortunate recipients. Uh, this means that he has a lot of time in his car waiting and it gives him ample opportunity to indulge in his love affair with Mary Jane. And I'm not talking about a female. But Dale appears to be the leading stoner in the film until we meet his dealer, Saul Silver. Now, Saul is forever, forever seeming like he is stoned. Um, and it makes Dale look like he's a Harvard genius. It really makes the audience question who loves weed more. Uh, nonetheless, Saul is very eager to sell Dale the finest product that he's ever procured, which is a stash of hash. That's, sorry, that rhymes. <laughs> dubbed Pineapple Express and that he had just recently got from his supplier named Red. Um, and he has the exclusive rights to distribute. Uh, later that same night, Dale tries to deliver a summons to a one Ted Jones and Dale is biding his time in his car in front of Jones's house getting high <laughs> when he witnesses Jones and a female police officer gun down a man. So in his panic, Dale just, he tosses his lit pineapple express joint out the window and he speeds away. Um, but there's a problem. Ted Jones is red supplier. So the discarded half smoked blunt quickly leads the drug kingpins back to Dale and Saul. So as the not so dynamic duo tries to stay clumsily, very paranoid, uh, step ahead of the pursuers, they're drawn into a bloody, a bloody turf war between Jones and an added Asian drug cartel. And they're all, they're determined to get rid of Saul and our dear, dear friend, Dale. Admittedly, pie is not my thing. So I had little connection to the drug aspect of the film. I did, however, really enjoy watching the dynamic between Franco and Rogan's character. I really loved how that played out. But originally their roles in the film were flip-flopped. Um, and Apto, he made the suggestion that they go ahead and like switch those roles and they all had agreed. And I think that was a really great, a really great choice. However, it is very interesting to me because Franco confessed that he does not, he does not smoke weed. Even though he has played many stoner roles, he is best friend with some of Hollywood's most vocal cannabis advocates, yet he doesn't smoke up. Um, I don't know about you, but I believe every moment he played Saul that he was, he was actually lit. <laughs> uh, I also really love the fact that Franco's character, Saul, um, was very attentive to his bubby. Uh, in fact, he became a drug dealer so that he could put her in the best senior living facility. He had other aspirations, but he wanted to take care of his bubby. That's pretty rad. Nice home entertainment. You're very entertained. Oh, wow, you got a cute picture, too. Oh, yeah. Me and my bubby. Hey, let me ask you something. Yeah. Now, Rogan didn't give any clear indicators in the film that the character was Jewish, but in real life, many of us know that Seth actually was born into a Jewish family. Um, and it is evident through his screenplays and his other writings that there's a Jewish presence. Um, he actually has a rather interesting backstory. Uh, he was born on April 15th. 1982, so his birthday is right around when I'm filming this. 
So happy birthday, Seth. Um, he was born in Vancouver, British Columbia, a Canadian. There can be funny. Uh, he's actually super funny. I love it. Um, his mother's name was Sandy. She worked as a social worker and his father was an American. Um, and he was, he worked for a nonprofit organization. So yay for nonprofits. Even uh, as a tween, Rogan had a clear, clear career path. He did not want to work in anything but comedy. Uh, he started in showbiz at a very early age at 12. He legitimately was a tween when he started, when he started into showbiz. Uh, he would perform comedy acts at bar mitzvahs, other types of parties, and later on in bars. But the one oddball job that I thought was like nuts that he did was, um, no, no pun. <laughs> Uh, he wrote jokes for a moil. Now, if you know what a moil does, I don't know that that's really the best time to be cracking, cracking jokes. It seems like a very serious, very sacred moment. Uh, but nonetheless, Seth got paid to create these jokes for, for this moil. By the time he was 13, Rogan and his childhood friend, Evan Goldberg, wrote the script for Superbad. 13. <laughs> Amazing. Um, what I find very interesting, though, is that three years later, when Seth was 16, his father had lost his job. His mother had quit her job and the family's finances were pretty tight. And so they, they had to downsize what they had going on. It also happened to be around the time that coincided with uh, Seth's acting debut in Freaks and Geeks. So at 16, he quickly became the family breadwinner. Very interesting backstory. So this movie, it is a solid R. Solid R. If you do not like profanity, violence, obviously drug use, um, talking about lady bits and man bits, um, avoid the film. <laughs> However, if you can get past the superficial surface value of it all, uh, there's actually quite a bit of this film that can prompt some deep thinking, some critical thinking, uh, but of course, you're going to have to get past cracking up over all of the lowbrow gags about drugs and sex. So again, this is Kristen's Take Me Back Tuesday pick. I hope that you will take a moment to enjoy the film. And this here is a perfect segue into why I chose a film where people were getting like super high through the whole entire film. So here's the segue. April 20th, 420 is fast approaching. What's so important about 420, Kristen? Well, for some, it's actually a super important day. It happens to be the day that many people celebrate marijuana and they happen to get really, really high. <laughs> uh, well, what does that mean for the Gershwin Philadelphia Jewish Film Festival? Well, we happen to like to get a different kinds of high. Uh, and that, it's a fun play on words. It's high. Uh, and please don't... <laughs> I'm going to apologize for it coming out of my mouth that way. I just, I can't roll it the way that I'm supposed to. But C-H-A-I, high. We like to get that kind of high. So on 420, when other people are getting a different kind of high, we are asking you to help us get not only high, higher, but to our highest goal of uh, our fundraising campaign on 420. 
So we are encouraging you between now and March, or I'm sorry, April 20th, uh, to make a donation to the Gershman Philadelphia Jewish Film Festival. Um, our staff is working from home and we are working very, very hard to create virtual programming for you. We are trying to make sure that we can maintain our staff and our programming in the future once we are able to reconnect in person. So please, please, please hear this. Uh, and if you are, if you are able to, any donation amount is, is very much appreciated. It's great if you can contribute the amount of what a, a chai tea latte would be, or for those of you that smoke up, what you would spend in a week on your weed. Uh, anything, anything would be very grateful and we would be most appreciative um, of that contribution. Uh, following the credits here, there's information about how you can give to the organization. Um, and we are here. Email us, call us if you have any questions. But in the meantime, as always, stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope that we will be able to gather soon enough. Thank you. If you catch me at the border, I got visas in my name. If you come around.